Uh, good morning. My name is Brad Harmon. I'm the managing partner of Hunter McLean, and I am, more importantly, a member of our logistics practice group. It's my privilege to welcome you all here for the uh, fourth annual Savannah Logistics Lunch. Uh, we've got a robust attendance again this year, and very glad to see that. Uh, before we begin, if anyone finds a green phone, if you will please take that to the registration desk, uh, we will give it back to its owner. Uh, Hunter McLean is extremely pleased to partner with the Center of Innovation for Logistics to present this lunch, which is a regional in-depth focus on the Georgia Logistics Summit, which takes place in Atlanta every year, typically in the spring. Uh, many in this room travel to Atlanta for that summit, so many of you know what the true value uh, you obtain from the information that's shared there, as well as sort of the collegial networking that you're able to uh, partake. And so uh, our firm and the center's idea is that we have on a smaller scale the same thing here uh, in the Savannah region. Uh, today's part or the partnership with the center has resulted in today's program, which is Managing More for the Future. Uh, which everyone has worked very hard to provide. We have an ambitious agenda, so we'll be serving and eating during the presentations and the panel discussion. Uh, as a result, we'll ask that the servers uh, keep the plates and glasses on the table to keep the noise level down. You'll find beverage refills on your table. Now, there are a few people I would like to recognize at this time. Thanks to Pier 1 Imports for this, this wonderful stage. It looks fantastic. Uh, C. Dow and Scott Campbell from Pier 1 were unable to join us today, um, but we definitely want to thank them for their contribution. I'd also like to thank Stage Front Productions. Uh, their team has worked with ours over the past few years on this event uh, to provide necessary audio and visual services, and they've done an outstanding job here once again today. They're recording this event as well, uh, and we will have that up on huntermcclain.com and our social media sites uh, shortly after this lunch concludes. Now let's get started. Sitting at one of the tables are Josh Hildebrandt, the Coastal Regional Manager for the Georgia Secretary of State, Brian Kemp, and Hunter Hall, uh, Field Representative for Congressman Buddy Carter. Uh, Secretary Kemp and Representative Carter were not able to be here today, but we are happy to have Josh and Hunter here on their behalf, so thank you for attending. Uh, we do, however, have a message from Representative Carter, and at this time I'd ask that you turn your attention to one of the screens uh, to hear that message. Thank you again for this invitation and for the opportunity to participate in the Savannah Logistics Lunch. This is always a great opportunity for our community leaders in the logistics space to get together and discuss the challenges and opportunities that are impacting our region. We're extremely fortunate to have the logistical network that we have here in coastal Georgia. As many of you know, one of my main federal funding priorities has been the Savannah Harbor Expansion Project. SHEP. As one of the most studied projects in the history of the Corps of Engineers and in the world, we are well into the deepening of our channel and the expansion of our port. In the recently passed Water Resources Development Act, we were able to authorize the new cost estimate for the project to ensure we don't incur any potential delays due to funding. On the funding side of things, we recently secured another $35 million to bring our annual funding total for fiscal year 18 to roughly $85 million. That's the highest funding for SHEP since the project was first authorized. The Savannah Port is one of the fastest growing ports not only on the East Coast, but in the world. With double digit growth month after month and year after year, it's a testament to the incredible planning and logistics to go into such a complex operation. Logistics are the key to the continued growth of not only SHIP, but our economic growth and world competitiveness. As trade continues to grow and the flow of goods become increasingly complex, we will depend on the world-class logistics network operating here. Thank you for what you do and for your continued professionalism and dedication to just such an important industry. Thank you, Hunter, for helping coordinate that message, and thank you, Representative Carter, for taking, <clears throat> excuse me, taking the time to record that message. Now I'd like to introduce Sandy Lake. Sandy is the Associate Director of the Center of Innovation for Logistics, who's going to give a brief recap of the 2018 Georgia Logistics Summit in Atlanta. She's also an invaluable part of the Savannah Logistics Lunch Planning Team, and please welcome me in joining Sandy.
Thank you, Brad. And, and likewise, the Center of Innovation is very excited to be a part of this event and to partner with Hunter McLean. I also want to bring greetings on behalf of the Centers of Innovation Directors for the Center of Innovation Program, Steve Justice, and the Center of Innovation for Logistics, Mr. Matt Markham, both of whom you have uh, wanted to be here today but were unable to attend. Um, the Centers of Innovation Program uh, is an industry, or, or sorry, is a, um, the state's leading resource for uh, business, facilitating business innovation. Through five centers, uh, assistance, Georgia companies, uh, sorry, <laughs> through the assistance of five centers, Georgia companies translate new ideas and technologies into commercially viable products and services um, to better compete in the global marketplace. As a division of the Department of Economic Development, the Centers of Innovation Program provides the technical industry expertise, uh, research collaborations, and business partnerships that enables the state's strategic industries to connect, compete, and grow. Uh, five individual centers, they each work statewide. They're focused around aerospace, energy technology, information technology, logistics, and manufacturing. And during fiscal year 2018, these five centers combined had 1,200 engagements in every region of our state, which generated $63 million in direct uh, economic benefits and supported announcements of about $395 million in future investment. So just one example of this with our Center of Innovation for Energy combined, uh, combined with Georgia Southern, uh, together they helped a company in Statesboro manufacture Efficen technology, commercialize a new product for the petroleum industry. To date, that project has generated about one and a half million dollars in local economic activity. Um, the Center, Inno Center of Innovation for Logistics works with partners uh, all across the state. Here locally, Savannah Tech, Georgia Southern, Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Ports Authority, and numerous industry um, groups and associations to build those uh, strong relationships that support the overall goals of the industry. Events like the Georgia Logistics Summit that was held in April and today's Savannah Logistics Lunch brings the industry together to discuss these um, timely issues and uh, share best practices so that we can advance Georgia's logistics ecosystem. Um, we maintain an office both in Atlanta and in Savannah. The one in Savannah is here on the Georgia campus. Locally, we're involved with the uh, Logistics Technology Corridor Initiative that's going on in this, in this area, in this region. We also work with um, the Workforce Partnership and Savannah, led by Savannah Tech and, and Coastal Worksource Georgia that's tackling the root causes of uh, workforce, critical workforce needs in the transportation, distribution, and logistics sectors. Um, the COI also leads an initiative around the future of mobility, which helps Georgia's, uh, make sure that Georgia's infrastructure investments are supporting the technology needs of the supply chains that are trying to capitalize on increasing visibility that um, is being generated by unprecedented uh, data that we are now able to to have access to as a result of advancing mobile technologies. And the last thing I want to mention is that uh, we are also working to generate a comprehensive economic impact study around Georgia's logistics industry and look forward to being able to bring that to you and share it next year. So thank you again for being here. Um, look forward to having a continued, building on these continued discussions that uh, help to inform and uh, prepare our industry, especially during these exciting times of growth and rapid change. So please join me now in welcoming Ms. the Honorable Ann Purcell. She currently serves as Vice Chair of the Georgia State Transportation Board, and she's also served in our Georgia House of Representatives. 
Anne is an outstanding public servant and leader in our state, and we are very honored to have her with us here today. So thank you, Anne. Thank you, Sandy. I'm so excited to be here today to bring you a little bit of news. You know, as uh, I usually am in Atlanta and always needing a little bit of transportation, and when I pull out to get my ride from one place to the other place, what comes up is, where are you going? And ladies and gentlemen, that's the question today. Where are you going, and what are you going to travel with, and how are you going to make your way? You know, as we look at managing more for the future being the thing today, we think about the fact of what's going on in our own communities and across the state of Georgia that benefits each and every one of us in our own businesses and work that we have throughout uh, our communities and our state. You know, as I thought about what our Congressman Buddy Carter was saying, and he was talking about our ports, but also, you know, our role in logistics and planning for the future goes with the drive of Georgia. Georgia is the first state that has been identified for business in the United States, and we're proud of that. We have the world's busiest airport in Atlanta, Hartfield International. We have here on the coast our own port, which is the fourth business, busiest port in Georgia and on the coast and in the United States. You know, what better can we ask for? You know, as I think about the harbor and the deepening to 47 feet, and I think about what our U.S. Army Corps of Engineers does, you know, we are getting ready this coming week. Uh, they are in making their announcement for their reservoir that has been completed, which will protect the, the uh, water that is here in Savannah for drinking water. So we're very proud of that team efforts that we have with GDOT with the ports and others that are involved with our deepening project. You know, progress just keeps coming. Progress, progress is out there as we prepare for the future. You know, we think about Georgia. Right now it ranks second in infrastructure and our global access. We are becoming one of the, the greatest states for the film industry. All of this is part of the infrastructure layout and the logistics for our state. Yes, it's very imperative that we in the state, that we come together and that we continue to plan for the future, the growth and the development that we have here in Georgia. The Department of Transportation biennially publishes a strategic plan for transportation throughout our state of Georgia. Why do we do this? Because it's our way of addressing the congestion and in improving our freight routes and human mobility. We will identify in these reports specific investments that the state needs to go forward in to advance the economic development in our state. With the coast of Georgia really being the top of the list as we do that strategic update, some of the things that are going on. One of the things that I want to uh, start telling you about is as you travel down our interstates and around, you're beginning to see a lot more of the message boards with messages put on them, helping folks as they travel our interstates, traveling through the state of Georgia. You also see cameras. And by the way, if you don't know, just go on 511 and you can find out exactly what's going on in our region. You can even look at the weather as it is affecting each of our interchanges here on the coast as well as I-16, I-75. That is a way to keep the public very involved. You know, as we continue with our transportation programs of the statewide signals and identifications of intelligence, this is going to be a helpful mode for us in the state of Georgia. You know, as we continue to work, I think about where, where do I really start in telling you about some of our projects? Let me start with the ports. The ports we're already doing a lot with US 25, with Brandon Avenue, working with that already in progress. We have the inland ports, one already located in Cordell, Georgia. The other one now has been in the planning stage and being built up in Dalton, Georgia. This is the way that we will have our rail service coming straight to the ports. And with the increased volume that the ports is having, this is a great way to get our 
products to the ports or the products from the port inland. So we're very proud to be a partner of the Georgia ports as well as our community locally here. The other way that is very positive, about a year ago, we had the Jim and Deloach Parkway extension that we actually opened and we called the last mile, even though it was longer than a mile, it was still the last mile to get us into the ports and to those gates. So we're excited about that. But let me tell you about a project that's going on right now, and I'm excited about this because it will certainly help us with the travel and with the needs of the infrastructure to get truckers in and out of the port. And with the Jimmy DeLoach Parkway, what we have are already in the process of doing, and you see evidence of that if you'll go out Highway 80 to Bloomingdale, where the Jimmy DeLoach now ends. And we're fixing the interchange there so that access is much easier than what it is there. But the real issue is here, not just that interchange, but we are going to be making that four lanes continue on out from US 80 all the way out to I-16 at the present ramp that is there, where the, that bridge is. We will have a new road from Bloomingdale all the way out past Pine Barren, and at Pine Barren, then it will be extended with the present road, four lanes. Ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful feat to bring back home from Atlanta that we're going to finish the Jimmy DeLoach all the way to I-16 and help our ports and the transit that goes on there. So we're extremely excited about that. And we estimate, by the way, this project to be completed in the fall of 2021. So I will stay after them, you can be assured, as your board member as I continue to push forward for what we have on our coast as well as throughout the state of Georgia. Now let's get to another issue that I get numerous calls about, and that is the I-16 widening and I-16, I-95 interchange improvements. We are so pleased to let you know we have let that project and we now have a contractor. And ladies and gentlemen, come early, January next year, you're going to see them out there digging some dirt and slinging it here and there because we're fixing to get two flyovers that's going to be built there. One will be coming from South I-95 as you get off normally now and get on I-16 coming east that you're going to be able to do a neat little flyover and not have all the congestion that is underneath that bridge. Then the other flyover will be from the I-16 westbound lane as you approach I-95, and instead of having that little clover leaf to go around, you're gonna have a flyover, and it's gonna go up, and it's gonna go south I-95. Then those clover leaves, we will have so that main traffic is going to be lessened in regards to how you and I get off of I-95 onto I-16. In addition to those two projects there with the widening, and we, are, we will start seeing a lot of that construction, you will see also the widening of I-16 all the way to I-516. So a third lane, and that third lane will, on each side will be put where we can in the median so that we don't affect more traffic than what we have to, and the traffic flow will still be there. The other thing that I'm working on, we've already got the ramps secured for Dean Forest Road and I-16, the ramps will be upgraded. But ladies and gentlemen, this is what I need a little bit of money for, and you can be assured I'm gonna go after it. And that is getting on Jimmy, uh, the Dean Forest Road after those ramps get fixed. What we have in the planning stage, and we are working very hard for the funding to be put into place there, is to do a diversion diamond. We already have the first one in the first congressional district. Now we're gonna get the second one in the first congressional district. You can see that we've got so much going on in our state with the looking forward of I-75 with a one lane for our truck traffic that we are in the planning stages too. If you need additional information, I will be around for a later talk if you have any questions. I'm just so glad to be here to share with you the progress that we have as we are adjusting to the future and planning in that direction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate that little nod. Thank you very much, Vice Chairman Purcell. That was some exciting updates on our infrastructure here in the state. Now I'd like to welcome uh, my law partner and friend, Chris Jordan, who's gonna be the moderator of uh, this event here today. Chris had joined us about a uh, year and a half ago 
from another law firm down in St. Simons where he had practiced uh, representing railroads for about 15 years. So with the advent of Chris or the joining of Chris with our logistics group, we've now got really the whole transit of goods covered from uh, maritime work when they're on the uh, vessels coming into the port, so warehousing lawyers and trucking lawyers, and now we've got someone with railroad experience. So I'm excited to hear what the panelists have today, but let me go ahead and introduce you to Chris Jordan. Thank you, Brad, and welcome again to everyone. I am excited to introduce our panel uh, and get underway, and we'll do that momentarily. But first, I want to introduce this year's topic, managing more for the future, with a quick story from the past. Dwight Eisenhower, before he became president, was in charge of the Allied forces in Europe during World War II. He oversaw the planning and execution of D-Day, which began the invasion of Normandy and ultimately led to the liberation of France. Eisenhower had to move two million troops, thousands of vehicles, and all sorts of equipment and supplies from places scattered across the hemisphere. He had to do it in unsafe seas and uncooperative weather, and he had to do it in secret because success depended in large part on deceiving the Germans about what was actually happening. As we know, it worked very well, and today it's considered one of the most audacious success stories in the history of warfare. For our purposes, it may also be the best example ever of effective supply chain management. Here's why I mention it today. In his later years, Eisenhower said that one of the biggest lessons he learned during the war was that, quote, the plan itself often proves useless, but the planning is indispensable. I think that sentiment is instructive for where we are at this moment in the logistics industry. In our area right now, we're in a boom. Um, as a admittedly incomplete list, and we heard about some of this earlier, the Savannah Harbor expansion project is over halfway complete. They recently broke ground in Pooler on the Port Logistics Center. They also recently broke ground on the Mason Mega Rail project. Um, and as some of you may not know, the Georgia legislature, Sandy mentioned this briefly, recently designated uh, an area between 95 and 16 as the Savannah Logistics Technology Corridor, which will further incentivize growth in technology and logistics in our area. All this is great news, but there's a lot of it, and it's coming at us pretty fast. We're all thinking through, with limited certainty, what exactly it will mean for our companies and how we can best manage the consequences. And to Eisenhower's point, as we try to manage all of this for the future, we want to position ourselves so that as change comes, as the unanticipated occurs, we're in the best position possible to adapt and to make smart adjustments. We also have to remember that at the same time we're enjoying a lot of positive growth in our area, there are a lot of broader forces at play that really aren't so positive and which complicate strategic planning even further. All this makes me very glad that my job today is just to ask questions, but uh, for answers we have four very knowledgeable panelists and it's my pleasure to introduce each of them briefly. To my immediate left is Howard Finkel with Ocean Carrier Costco. Howard is Executive Vice President of Costco Shipping Lines North America. In his 36-year career, Howard uh, has worked in all phases of ocean transportation, including operations, regulatory affairs, sales, pricing, and marketing. He joined Costco in 1995, and in his current role, he oversees contract review, regulatory affairs, legal affairs, cost control, public relations, mergers and acquisitions, and company spokesmen. Uh, to Howard's left is Carl Warren. Uh, Carl is the Director of Port Development for CSX Transportation. Uh, Carl oversees industrial development 
and port development uh, for a portion of CSX's system that spans much of the eastern seaboard from here through New England and into Quebec. Uh, Carl has diverse public and private sector experience, having worked extensively in real estate, uh, operations planning, sales and marketing, and of course port development. Also pleased to introduce Aaron Donnelly. Uh, Aaron is Director of Delivery Solutions for the Home Depot. Aaron has been with the Home Depot for over 10 years, specializing in supply chain management and inventory management. Prior to joining Home Depot, Aaron worked as a consultant and operations analyst in the logistics sector. Our fourth panelist is John Edwards. John is the Vice President of Trade Port Logistics, which is a transloading and port drayage company here in Savannah. John has deep roots in Savannah and in its logistics industry. Before helping to start Trade Port, John was an executive with American Port Services, which began here in Savannah in 1987. Uh, and went on to expand across the country. John's also spoken at this luncheon before, and we very much appreciate him joining us again this year. And so with that, we'll get started. Um, Howard, the first question is, is for you. Uh, a supply chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And both here in Savannah and across the country, there is a shortage of truck drivers. How has the trucking shortage uh, in the U.S. affected your business, and what is Costco doing to address the problem? Okay, um, a very severe problem. Um, the way we operate most lines, I, I won't talk just for Costco because I've been with other lines, <clears throat> and I think the whole industry is going through a bit of a crisis with trucking. At one point, uh, carriers basically dealt with port-to-port -port cargo. As things got more sophisticated, uh, shippers wanted us to, to do intermodal cargo involving rail and truck. CYCY cargo is fairly easy, no problem, especially Port Savannah here. It's one of the best ports in the United States, operationally excellent. Um, rail, we've got great rails in, in the United States. Uh, when we contract with a shipper for intermodal rate, for a rail move, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty good because basically we negotiate with the railroads for usually year-long contracts. So whatever your rate is in the contract for a year, usually our contracts are for a year, the rail rate's protected for a year. Trucking, completely different situation. There's a real trucking shortage in the United States today. Um, there's not enough drivers. Um, they can build more trucks, but uh, until we get uh, dr trucks that can really drive themselves, which will come up eventually, um, we just don't, there, there's not enough money to, to in, in, in entice people to become truck drivers. So there's a real shortage of truckers. We very rarely can sign long-term contracts with shippers, with truckers. So we can have a rate in a contract with a trucking component that say starts at the contract at $200, that can go up basically every month. There's nothing like the Federal Maritime Commission that, that regulates us. Um, truckers can raise the rates. So we've had situations where we'd start with a trucking component at $200. At the end of the contract, it's $800. Uh, I don't know if you know this. Most of you probably do if you're in shipping. <laughs> The lines are not making huge profits. Usually for years we've been in, in the red. So taking a rate that's $200 and $800, we're really losing money. So what to do? There's a lot of things. A lot of the carriers have put in an emergency um, $300 charge for trucking. The FMC, I'm on the phone with them all the time because I, I deal, deal with the government and regulatory affairs. They don't like this. I don't like it, truthfully. It's not a good solution because I can tell you why. Most of your contracts, your sophisticated shippers, have something in there that says no new surcharge clause. So if you put a trucking surcharge clause in for $300, it sounds good. You know, you look good to the press. Hey, look what we're doing. We're, but you're not going to get it. What we've tried to do, I negotiate the contract terms for Costco. It's basically put in, being very honest in the contract and say, look, trucking in the United States now is very volatile. Uh, if you have a trucking component in one of your rates, 
it will be noted with an asterisk and that trucking component will be broken out if during the life of the contract that trucking rate increases by more than 10 percent um, that will have to be borne by the shipper if if the shipper disagrees they can cancel that particular rate um, we're trying to negotiate with with truckers we do have a small trucking division within Costco but this is this is a real problem I mean we have to get the cost in line and once you get the cost in line that's our problem your problem is getting enough truckers um, and the only way you're gonna get that is one driverless trucks which is probably a couple of years away or make sure these people get a, a decent living wage so you can entice more truck drivers in the United States. Thank you, Howard. Uh, Carl, next question is for you. Like Howard, your job you know, means that you work in a lot of different places. CSX has, I think, around 70 ports. Uh, and with its ocean ports, it spans basically the full length of the Atlantic coastline and much of the Gulf coastline as well. Uh, from CSX's perspective, how is Savannah different? No, I think it's a, um, it's, it's a great question. I've been fortunate enough in, through my career both to work for uh, Western Railroad, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, and an Eastern Railroad, uh, and a Port Authority. So I've sort of seen this thing from um, a lot of different angles. And, you know, one thing that I learned years ago, and this was actually when I was working for uh, a port out west called the Port of Portland in Portland, Oregon, this was back in about 2002, 2003, not long after the, um, after the longshoremen had gone on strike on the, on the West Coast, and, and shippers were thinking about something at the time um, that was called gateway diversification, thinking about using you know, different ports, different supply chain patterns to, um, to move their goods. And we were trying to figure out how to grow our port. We were 100 miles up a river, uh, we were struggling with um, being able to get steamship calls. Uh, we were doing well with uh, attracting domestic customers, but the international was really a challenge. So we did some research and some benchmarking, and even back then, the place that really jumped out at us was Savannah. And so I, I remember coming here and meeting uh, the port director at the time, Doug Marchand, uh, and looking at the port's plans for what they wanted to do with warehouse and distribution, what they wanted to do with um, their uh, Garden City terminal and the challenges that, that would accompany that. And, and it was really, there were two things that really struck me about Savannah. One was that the, even, even then there was a strong long-term vision, which I think is critical to success in this area, um, there was a willingness to look beyond the edge of the terminal fence uh, back then as well, which is very important for the interface with the local trucking community and with the railroads. At the time, they had the, um, the first phase of intermodal done with Norfolk Southern at that um, Mason intermodal yard. And then when I joined CSX a few years later, I was fortunate enough to participate in the um, development of the Garden City intermodal terminal. But none of these things would have been possible without a very strong alignment uh, between the state and the port and clearly understanding the compelling economic development, job creation uh, proposition that exists by getting the logistics thing right. And so there, there are some plenty of strong ports out there. We, I've dealt with a lot of them, but I have to say that's one way that Savannah really stands out. Thank you, Carl. Aaron, next question um, is for you, and it's a little more general in nature. Home Depot obviously has a lot of logistics partners, and it relies on them to a great extent. What are the most important qualities and metrics that the Home Depot looks for in its partners? Absolutely. And first, um, I do want to comment that um, Home Depot does have a strong partnership in general with Savannah and the Port Authority, and we feel like that is a very important partnership. So I did want to 
give some appreciation to everybody in this room for having these types of discussions because one of the most important things to us in terms of partnership is collaboration and open communication to be able to talk about the problems. Um, a trucking shortage for a carrier is a trucking shortage for Home Depot. So there is no difference in um, the problems we face and the problems you face. So as we're measuring performance, there's 50% the numbers, how does our on time look, how fast are you, um, how consistent are you, but at the same time, can we have open discussions, can we talk about some new and innovative ideas to solve some of these bigger problems. Um, I'd rather be innovative and say, can we be more consistent even if we're slower, or can we um, be faster but more predictable? So talking through those variables and not just a solid, how does an on-time number look, but how does that look in terms of the bigger picture? How do our customers review us? A lot of times um, the operational metrics look great, but when we survey our customers, they're telling us they're having a bad experience. Um, an on-time metric doesn't tell you if a driver was very rude when they came and dropped something off. So we monitor how our customers um, are telling us what's wrong and the customers are telling us what their needs are as well. Thank you. John, a question for you that's, that's more unique to Savannah. The, the river is getting deeper, the ships are getting bigger, and they're arriving with greater frequency. As a third-party services provider, what, what do you see as the impacts of all this growth? You know, what we see at Tradeport is a, is a need for more doors and more yard space. Um, the typical buildings that are developed just don't have enough parking. As we see more containers coming in on these vessels, it's going to put more pressure on the outside infrastructure. I mean, the port has done a great job for us being ready for those vessels, but now we've got to make sure we've got the buildings and the facilities outside of the port to be able to keep up pace. And I saw some folks from the GPA in here today, and I wanted to thank them for Jimmy Deloach Parkway, because when we had the jet crash there, that, that was a, a great artery to be able to get around. So it helps the truck traffic, but at that point, it, it helped the whole community. The, uh, the needs uh, we just see increasing, the, the bigger ships, if they don't have the infrastructure outside of it, we're going to see that volume either stay on the west or move to areas that do have the buildings and the yards to support the volume. Thank you, John. Howard, uh, back to you. Uh, we're talking a lot about the various changes that we're all dealing with in the ocean carrier industry. I think it was a little over a year ago that the major carriers reorganize themselves into new alliances. And my ultimate question is, how's that going so far? But for the group's benefit, it may help to start with what an alliance is, what function has, have they typically served in the carrier industry? Sure. Um, basically, uh, when I started in the industry, it's going on 38 years ago. <clears throat> you were a carrier, you operated your own vessels, you operated your own equipment. You actually had chassis. <laughs> I started with Sealand. We probably started the debacle with every box has wheels. Um, but as the business became more and more competitive, um, you needed to basically have partners. Um, everybody seems to be very concerned about you know bigger ships. Um, bigger ships are a necessity. You know uh, when I negotiate. At one point, a couple of years ago, I was actually head of trade for Costco, so I was actually negotiating. Now I negotiate the terms, the legal terms of the contract, but then I was negotiating the rates. <clears throat> and I used to love it when sometimes you'd be negotiating with shippers and they'd say, well, we need a lower rate because you've got too much capacity. And yeah, that was true. But then later on in the negotiation, they said, we want to make sure that during peak season, that capacity can meet our needs. So on one hand, you want a lower rate, but on the other hand, you want to guarantee that there's going to be enough space. Anyway, we're at the point now where it's extremely competitive, um, and you got to get the lowest box rate you can to try to make money. Uh, last year, I think some carriers made some money, but the last five years, it's it's been pretty bad. It's been in the red. So. A couple of years ago, we started alliances where big carriers got together. Um, you know, there were some, some problems at first. I think the, the first big one was the, the 3M when Merce tried to start, but the, the, uh, the FMC, and I believe China, shot it down because they wanted, they had a, 
their operating group was a huge group, and they just thought they would they really wouldn't be three carriers. They'd be one carrier, and there'd be less competition. Anyway, things settled down, and the first wave of uh, alliances came about. Went pretty good. Um, truthfully, we were uh, our alliance was okay. Unfortunately, one of our partners, um, after years and years of uh, losing money, Hanjin went out of business. Um, we figured, okay, our alliance is going to be hurt the most, but the way the steamship industry is, a lot of other lines outside of our alliance had agreements with Hanjin, so it basically affected everybody. So there was a rethink, and then around a year and a half ago, nearly all the alliances reshuffled. We're now in something called the Ocean Alliance, which is Costco, Evergreen, CMA, CGM, and OCL. Of course, now you probably you know that uh, it's 99.9% .9 done. We're still waiting for some American regulatory issues, but uh, Costco did buy or will technically buy OCL. But what we're trying to do, we're trying to learn from the mistakes of uh, the first alliances. One of the biggest issues that we had, you have all these carriers and they have terminals all over the place, they have equipment all over the place. At the time the alliances started, they did have chassis. Now most of the carriers have divested themselves of chassis. However, so now what we've done is within the Ocean Alliance, I think most of the alliances are trying to do the same thing, is if you have one service, you don't want someone going in, picking up a container from one spot and delivering it to another spot because different vessels, different terminals. We're trying to keep uh, one service, one string for one terminal. Um, we're trying to streamline operations. Um, we would have liked to have more ability to negotiate with third parties. The FMC was very, very wary of that, so we basically agreed not to unless we go to the FMC and ask for a specific, uh, uh, you know, approval of that, and then it would have to be put into the uh, alliance uh, contract with the FMC. But uh, I think things are getting better. Um, the Ocean Alliance, we've done very, very well. Um, save cost, I think uh, we've got Costco now, of course, uh, nearly three years ago now, we kind of merged with China Shipping to, for one company. We don't, Ch China doesn't like to say a merger. We got together. Um, so we're offering more services, more sailings. Um, so I think the alliance concept is good and why some people say, oh, we don't, we're not crazy about it because we don't really see enough individuality. It's a necessity for uh, the lines to get it together and it's a necessity to get the biggest vessel, vessels possible to get the lowest possible slot cost. Great, thank you, Howard. Uh, Carl, there have been a few references already this morning to the Mega Rail project. Uh, and they, they recently broke ground. The idea behind the project is to greatly increase our rail capacity and to increase rail service capabilities to the Midwest as one of two Class 1 railroads operating here in Savannah, wh what does the mega rail project mean to CSX? Well, I, I think the, uh, the mega rail project, it's funny, I, mean, I had the opportunity to talk earlier about um, those initial investments that the port made in intermodal capacity, and that was going back, you know, 10 years. At that time, um, you know, vessel sizes were different the amount of intermodal that was moving was was different and i think what the mega rail represents is is that move to the next level it's that move to um, accommodating the larger ships dealing with larger blocks of inland intermodal cargo and digesting the tremendous scale that comes with things like the harbor expansion happening the bigger cranes the bigger ships the, the economies uh, that the industry uh, demands at this point. For CSX, it really gives us a, a seat at the table to grow. Uh, we were really starting to see a point in time in Savannah where while the port was growing, we were becoming more and more apprehensive about having capacity to be able to really grow with it. And I think what it means for us is a, a solid future here in Savannah um, and also the ability to operate 
more efficiently and more effectively. So we're very, very excited about this investment. Thank you, Carl. Aaron, we all hear a lot of talk quite appropriately about uh, disruption. And the Home Depot is obviously right in the middle of a lot of that disruption. What are the, the side effects of, of disruption in services to the end customer? Yes, so there has been, um, the last several years, um, we've been rolling out a project to try and reduce some of these disruptions and um, reduce the effects they have on the store. You may have um, heard of it, we have a project called Sync. Um, the ultimate goal being if the supply chain's going smooth all the way to the end, that a box just comes off the truck and goes directly to the shelf. You don't get big swings of inventory that have to go in the overhead and then be reworked. Um, because it ends up causing problems for our partners as well when things like that happen. So if there's a disruption and um, we have a backlog of things at our warehouse that we're not unloading, we're holding up everybody's equipment, which is causing more problems to get that equipment turned and move again. Um, and then ultimately, we end up saying, well, we're going to have to hold more inventory just in case these disruptions happen again. And we spike an order at probably the worst time when something is going wrong in the first place. Um, so we don't want to have to overreact and continue to cause these whips that go up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, so if we can, the plan has been to continue to go further and further back in the supply chain all the way to whether it be China or domestic and say, we want everyone to know what we're planning, what we're forecasting, what the future is going to look like so there's no surprises so that we don't continue to cause each other problems by overreacting and swinging one way to the other. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, John, another question more about Savannah specifically. Uh, with all this growth, with all of this development, it's gobbling up a lot of land. Uh, in, in your opinion, it, it, is there available industrial land near the port right now? Can you? You know, currently there's, there's land, but it's being built on now. So the, the Savannah River International Trade Park has got about 5 million square feet coming out of the ground where we have our 100 door cross dock and a 660,000 square foot distribution center coming up. But around that is just nothing but construction. Um, what we look out at and managing for the future is that's kind of the last um, large block of land near the port. Everything that's under development now as we look out is going to be either up into Effingham um, or out into the I-16 corridor, um, further out Jimmy DeLoach, which is, is scary a little bit when we think about the, the trucking shortages and the driver shortages. As we start to move further out, then we're just going to be potentially you know, causing ourselves some harm. Um, so there, there is a concern as we look out that there's going to have to be development further out. There's going to have to be continued infrastructure, as, as Ann talked about, to, to support that growth as we spread out. Thanks, John. Uh, Howard, back to you. Uh, another change in the ocean carrier industry is that in, I think it was February of this year, the Trans-Pacific Stabiliz Stabilization Agreement, or the, the TSA, uh, ceased operations. Uh, and for a long time, uh, that discussion group had served as a forum for carriers to discuss trade conditions, market conditions, you know, rate issues, uh, Given that it no longer exists, uh, how is that affecting the industry so far? Um, interesting question. The uh, you know I was member of TSA for years and years. Uh, as you know, in America we have antitrust immunity. Uh, right now, it's not being used at all. Um, as uh, some of you may know, the uh, informal the, the TSA stands for Trans-Pacific Stabilization Agreement. The informal name was the Liars Club. We basically got into rooms and, and lied to each other, saying we're getting rates up, and uh, hardly ever worked. The only time it really got got going is when we had issues on uh, on the West Coast and Long Beach and strike issues, and we were able, I mean, one year, I remember we got a $1,000 GRI, but most of the GRIs went by the wayside. Um, the interesting fact about this is 
Um, I was, I am still, because it still exists, uh, chairman of something called the TCS, which is like the financial arm of the TSA. And um, what happens is we decided as, as the TSA, uh, now it's almost two years ago, we were in San Francisco area, and we decided this rate issue, this getting rates and surcharges is going nowhere. We really want to change the whole focus of the TSA to be an industry group, bringing the shippers more, talk about trade issues. Um, so we decided really to suspend um, talking about rates. The funny thing is, next door there's something called the Box Club where all the executives met. And what happens, the TSA basically decided that we were gonna no longer speak about rates and the next day, the box club, the CEOs were gonna come in and basically ratify our agreement that we're no longer gonna speak about rates. However, the same afternoon we agreed not to talk about rates. Subpoenas were served on the box club because they were talking about antitrust issues, which I'm not sure they realized that we actually had antitrust immunity. But the box club didn't talk about rates, we did anyway. So, I mean, this whole Justice Department probe didn't really have to go on because we weren't going to talk about rates, but whatever. It's going on now. We decided we were going to suspend activity and rate activity. And basically, uh, with all this other activity, we just decided to put the TSA on hold. I don't know if it'll ever, ever come back again. One of the issues that I'm really uh, concerned about right now is we were going to have an outreach program, talk more about shippers, bring them in to forums where we can have groups of shippers and groups of carriers come and speak about uh, issues and improve the whole supply chain. That's not going to happen right now because everybody's a little paranoid about getting together in a group because there is no TSA. Another issue is we have bunker issues. The, the TSA came up with a pretty good bunker plan. Um, years ago, we went back and forth with shippers, and we finally found the bunker uh, formula that worked. Um, it's a little old, old right now. It really does with the new low sulfur fuel. It doesn't really capture all the costs. So right now, every carrier is kind of doing their own thing. Um, I would like to see some kind of forum again, so we could discuss issues, trade issues, bunker issues. But right now, with a lot of political things happening, I don't see it. I don't see it happening. The, uh, the purely rate-making, surcharge-making uh, issues that the TSA dealt with, though, were, is, in my opinion, never very effective. Thank you, Howard. Carl, if I could, I'd like to circle back to something you said a moment ago when you were talking about the effect of the mega rail project on on CSX and the way CSX. Uh, views that. If you could give us a little more information on what challenges you think CSX is facing and needs to overcome in order to operate the way it wants to, as efficiently as it can here in the Savannah area. You know, I mean, first off, I mean, I think that the, you know, the mega rail project itself is really a, a great visionary step forward by, by the port. And I think that kind of the next area of, of opportunity in terms of really being able to help assure the, not only the efficiency of rail operations, I mean, we, we, with that facility, we'll be able to get in out of this port very efficiently, but um, that project also includes some grade separation components, which are also vital to assure the circulation of drayage around the port. And that's one of the other things that I think has been done exceptionally well here. But to, but to keep growing, we need to keep looking at those opportunities to separate trucks, cars, and trains, especially in heavily trafficked areas around marine terminals. So I'd say that you know, continuing to have an eye toward that in the future where, you know, where can grade crossings be closed or roadway systems be changed to take advantage of opportunities to cross over railroads. I think that'll make a big difference for mobility around the port. Great. Thank you, Carl. Aaron, uh, 
from everyone's own personal experience, I think we can probably all agree that the way customers are behaving uh, has changed and is continuing to change. Perhaps our expectations as customers are also changing. Uh, from, from your standpoint, uh, how are these changes in customer behavior affecting the Home Depot? <coughs> Customer expectations are changing extremely fast. Everyone in here um, is a consumer, so from your own personal experience, um, you've probably used Uber and been able to see the car driving right up to where they're going to pick you up. Um, but when it comes to the technology that we can give the customers on when things are coming to them, um, there's definitely you know a gap to that level of expectation that's now been set by the in, you know other parts of the industry to um, our visibility and our communication amongst all of our different partners. More and more customers want things delivered to them, and not only delivered to them, but potentially assembled for them, and um, some value-added services that we're not used to doing. How do you bring um, a supply chain industry together with a service industry at the same time? So we have some technology um, roads that we have to go down to make sure that people want to know is it going to be late, people want to know if there's a problem, people want to be able to check it on their app. Um, and then there's a speed component. Um, a few years ago, two days was making the news, right? You can get something in two days, and now that's the expectation. We are covering the entire country in two days right now, or the majority of the country, and the next goal is how do you get to one day, which wasn't even a conversation not that long ago. So getting closer and closer to the customer is increasingly important. So. From your perspective as well, how do we get closer and closer in to where the population of the people are so that we can react that fast? So getting further and further into where the population hubs are in the major cities. Thanks, Aaron. John, another question about managing the growth here in our area. Uh, all this growth means more jobs, but we need a adequate labor force to perform those jobs. In, in your opinion, uh, where are we from an available labor standpoint here in Savannah? In my opinion, um, we're currently treading water. Um, and there's a lot of new buildings coming up. Um, so when you look at that with where labor sits today and these new buildings coming online, it's a concern. We've spent a lot of time, um, Sandy Lake talked about the center and the center's put together some programs and brought together some of the big staffing users in the market, sitting down just trying to collaborate and see what we can do to make things better for that labor force because we don't sit here and want to use labor. Our business is driven by the steamship lines and the calls when they come. So we can't have full-time labor on, on staff because we might have 20 containers one week and 200 the next. So it's it's a requirement for us, and we keep looking at ways to, to try to make things easier for the laborers to, to get to work, to you know, find the hours they need. And the sector partnership is a really interesting thing right now for our area. The, the state has put money together, and there's a, a real energy behind bringing together those labor users and making sure that we've got a communication platform and, and conversations around how to keep those people busy. If I only need people Monday through Wednesday and those people are sitting home Thursday and Friday, that's not good for the, the whole industry. It's, it's not good for Savannah. So these sector partnerships, I think, are going to be really crucial as we go forward and we see the five million square foot of buildings come out of the ground um, very near the port. Thank you, John. Uh Howard, back to you. It, it seems like every few days there is an escalation between the U.S. and China over tariffs. Uh, given how much of your business um, is based on trade between those two countries, uh, what's your opinion of, about the, the trade war, the looming possibility of a trade war, and how do you think it's going to affect Costco? Okay. Um, I'm not a politician. Um, however, I, uh, an interesting fact is uh, I grew up literally 10 blocks from Donald Trump. Um, I thought originally this issue with the tariffs and the retaliation 
was saber rattling. Right now, from my, and this is only my opinion, it looks like um, the president has kind of backed himself in a corner because his base wants him to look tough on certain countries, of course, China being one of them. Uh, but uh, these other countries, especially China, is, is not going to back down easily. Um, I'm still hopeful because um, China needs our huge market and we need China's inexpensive, I don't want to say cheap, <laughs> we need China's inexpensive goods. Uh, I can tell just a, a small story. When Costco started, um, when President Nixon and Henry Kissinger went and met with uh, Chairman Mao, um, right after that, there was an agreement that the first vessel would go from Shanghai, it was a Costco vessel, to the Port of Seattle. And there was going to be an American vessel going from the Port of Seattle to Shanghai. That was a Likes vessel. I worked for Likes, too, so I kind of saw this from both angles, right? Uh, the funny thing is, uh, when I first started at Costco, the... Uh, the people who were around when the first vessel came to the United States at Howard, it was, it was very strange because when we first sent, it was uh, the Lulin High was the name of the vessel. We sent it over to Seattle. We were racking our brains. What in the world could, you know, it was just ceremonial to, to break the, uh, the impasse to get a vessel over here. But what in the world are we going to put on this vessel? There's nothing that China manufactures that the USA wants. <laughs> so what they did is they put a crate of nails, Chinese nails, and a crate of tea. Today, basically, practically all consumer goods or most are manufactured in China. So as I said, the saber rattling and, and wanting to be strong, okay, we can be strong, but that 32-inch TV that at one point was $1,200, that's now $300. That starts creeping back up to $1,200. That base is going to be very upset. They look at, you know, okay, strength is one thing, but then hitting you in the pocket is another thing. How is it? I mean, it is effect. We haven't seen really a lot of uh, effect of this yet. There is some effect. There is some weakening of imports with these steel tariffs and plastic. Um, there's a lot of goods that are, are going to be more expensive for the consumer, and people are buying less. Um, a lot of lines. I know Costco this summer have had two blank sailings because the market was a little weak. Uh, exports, um, there's retaliation on agricultural products, a huge export to China's soybeans. That's going to be affected. So yes, this will affect. Uh, I'm just hoping that cooler heads prevail and people realize that uh, a trade war is no good for anyone. Uh, if not, we're going to be paying a lot more for goods, and people working for lines are going to. There's going to be less uh, less vessel sailing because they're they're. You're not going to be filling these slots. So I'm I'm still cautiously optimistic that the saber rattling will stop. But I'm not a politician. Well, we appreciate your candor. I know it's an interest, uh, an issue that all of us have a great interest in. So thank you for that. Carl, uh, a question that's maybe a little less loaded. <laughs> um, in, again, you work in ports all over the place. You see their strengths and weaknesses. What do you think we here in Savannah need to be thinking about so that we are in the best position to manage additional freight? Well, you know, it, it came up a little bit earlier. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it is is continuing the very strong, forward-looking things that the port and the state are doing in terms of thinking about the, you know, the intermodal interface, uh, grade separations, investing in the marine terminal for large ships, um, dealing with uh, the harbor expansion. I mean, all of those things are important, but, um, you know, earlier when we were talking about industrial land, I, I can't underscore the importance of having a a viable industrial land supply and, and really very carefully thinking about how to keep that linked to the port and to the regional uh, supply chain. 
making sure you've got land in a, a place where there's there's a workforce accessible to it, where people can commute to work relatively easily in a short period of time. Because if you've got that, you've got the space you need for warehouse and logistics, uh, but you also have the space that you need for uh, attracting manufacturers to the state and and creating you know large tranches of jobs and cargo that way. Um, so I would I would just encourage um, as as the as the port and the state move forward to kind of keep that land supply and really linking it to everything right in the bullseye. Thank you, Carl. Aaron, another question about sort of the broader changes that we're seeing in, in the supply chain management world. It, it seems like many of our most successful big box retailers came to prominence at a time that, uh, and created their infrastructures at a time that predated the rise of, of omni-channel and, and e-commerce and a whole host of other uh, new things. What, as a result of all those changes, what, what's Home Depot's long-term plan for its, its infrastructure? Yes, earlier this year we laid out a five-year plan to really double down on infrastructure and assume that nothing's going to change in terms of e-commerce growth and continued customer expectations. Um, over the years we've had an international channel, a domestic channel, an e-commerce channel, and they were working somewhat separately. So there's two big themes to the next five years. One is that we are going to be one supply chain, that's the name of the project, but that we utilize all the resources we have and it doesn't matter who's going to buy it or where it comes from, um, we're, we're one supply chain. And then we're going to make some pretty massive investments in getting close to the customer, opening um, local warehouses across the company so that we can provide um, same-day service um, to um, a large percentage of the population. Um, this is going to be, the numbers are really staggering in the um, amount that we are putting down in this infrastructure um, and the number of warehouses that we're going to be opening. So it is full steam ahead um, that we are going to be concentrating on getting much faster, making sure that um, we also own a lot of that space and own the customer experience. We are still gonna work with um, companies and partners to get all of this stuff done, um, but we wanna make sure at the same time that um, we, we know where the customers are, we're located where the customers are, we hear their expectations. There's a lot of information about it on our investor relations page. If you want to know more details, there's a big PowerPoint there where you can f find out a lot about where our new buildings are um, going to be planned and how many. But it is um, full steam ahead, not slowing down um, at all, and completely looking at infrastructure more than anything else to set us up for the future. That's great to hear. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, John, I'd like to ask you to expand, if you could, uh, on something you mentioned earlier. Um, I think many of us would agree that, that workforce issues can be fairly confounding. And, and you mentioned some uh, initiatives that may be going on in our area. I know there are a lot of folks that are doing good, hard work to try to you know, help solve some of the issues that we have. Could you tell the group um, a little bit more about your involvement or what you know about some of those initiatives? We were just a, uh, a participant, and again, it was put on by the state and, and with folks from Savannah Tech and, and others. The sector partnership is their, their mission, and I don't pretend to be an expert on it, is to, to help ensure that we've got the labor for the future and help make sure we're doing the right things for the labor force now so that we're building and not um, rescinding. Um, and, and Kevin is here from, from the um, Savannah Tech to um, can probably add more to it than, than I have. But what was exciting to us was just that, you know, for us locally and, and competitors to sit down and, and have conversations about labor um, sharing, you know, there's a little bit of reluctance to do that. But having the state involved and the GPA hosted the event. So bringing all those folks together in a room and having the, the state there and the center there to kind of temper any fears of, um, you know, 
competition or anything like that. And having that open dialogue is is exciting to me because, again, there, there's times when, when we have driven as, as third-party providers, our business just dictates, you know, a couple days a week sometimes, depending on the movement. And those people wind up sitting at home because there's not a good communication link to really reach out to the, I mean, a shift for us is 100 people. Um, so when you look at that on two different shifts or three shifts, that's a, that's a lot of people moving in and out the door. And you've got to have good staffing partners. And, and there's some new technologies out there that I think are pretty exciting. And, and we've got some partners in the room here today that, um, that have that and it's it's a mobile phone app that that gets communication out to folks it gets the information about the facility so that you don't have somebody walk in the door and, and we need them to work they walk in the door and they go this isn't what i thought it was going to be so getting the information out communicating with that workforce making sure that we've got the right amenities for those folks is crucial and then the, the state programs and the things that they're doing are exciting to us because I can tell you over the last three years when customers come to town, the first question they ask is, are you going to have labor to support our needs? So it, it's becoming known that with the amount of business and, and things that we have going on in our port that our labor is, is, is a concern. So again, when you have a big customer come in that is swinging 18,000 containers through our port and their first question is, are you going to be able to provide me labor to, to do this? That, that's, a, that's a problem. That's a great answer, John. Thanks very much. You mentioned a lot of the other folks that are in the room. There are obviously a lot of stakeholders here that probably have thoughts about that. And due to time constraints, it's time for us to move to the question and answer portion of the program. Before we do that, thank you each very much. Those, that was a really uh, stimulating conversation, and I know everyone appreciates it. There's a lot more we could talk about just among the five of us, but I think it's time to open it up uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, are there any, any questions for our panel? Yes, sir. Hey, John, thank you. Uh, Kevin Mark, Savannah Tech. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you all for being here today. And my brain is spinning because everything you're talking about starts to bring me back to our workforce and what John just referenced. So through this High Demand Career Initiative, Savannah Tech is partnered with Workforce Coastal in workforce development programs. And so this project seeks to be a third party to sit and collect data, use empirical data, but then dive a little bit deeper into more dimensional data. Uh, like I'm sure Aaron could talk to us about how you take that data set and start to crunch it down so you can have pinpoint strategic targets that will help you with the profitability of your business and customer experience. I think we can use this project in the same manner. And what I would like to ask from the panel is, can you give us your guidance as we engage the community and the partners who are on parallel courses to support our workforce, what would you see as a good return on our investment using project management principles that we're applying to this? Where would you see our efforts best served that would then in turn help you advance your strategic goals uh, in our region and beyond? So, It's a great question. Anyone like to go first? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, you know, Kevin, um, you know, walked through quite a bit there. Um, and to me, it's, it's really about the collaboration and the, and the willingness to just face the fact that there's things that we need to be better at to, to make sure that the workforce is there and, and ready. Because if we're not, um, the, the volume's going to go somewhere where the workforce is ready. And, and again, when we talked earlier about the land and, and um, being available further out, I mean, that's just a, a further concern. So if we don't start here now, as that continues to spread out, it's the problem is just gonna to get worse and worse. And, and again, having the folks that we have in the room to help drive this and push it where we don't have the fears of competition and things um, in front of us, I think is a, is a big deal. Neither comments from the panel, Aaron? I was just gonna add beyond um, what's needed from that perspective as well. We um, feel very strongly that we have a lot of things that we analyze and work on, and it's um, out in the landscape of labor out there, making sure that that analytical horsepower is out there, understanding the tools that we're using um, to crunch all this data. Um, sometimes you know in the education sector or maybe a little bit behind what the real world's doing and getting that connection to kind of a step up on that analytical forefront. Thank you, Aaron. Any other questions? Okay. 
Well, thank you all very much again. We certainly appreciate it. I'll bring, uh, ask Brad Harmon to return to uh, wrap us up and adjourn us. Well, that was a great panel. Join me in giving a hand to Chris and the panelists here. Fantastic. If you uh, happen to have any further questions that may come to your mind, uh, either now or after you leave, uh, our, our speakers, speakers will be here for a few minutes. And if you have something that comes to your mind after you leave, you can certainly get in touch with Andrea Dove at our office and we'll try to uh, facilitate an answer. Uh, additionally, your feedback on this event is very welcome. Uh, we have an online survey. The website is printed on the screens and you'll receive it by email as well. Uh, you can also share your feedback directly with me, Chris Jordan or Andrea Dove or uh, one of the members of the Center of Innovation for Logistics. One last thank you to our panelists, to Chris Jordan for moderating Pier 1, Stage Front, uh, and the staff and servers here at the Savannah International Trade and Convention Center. And especially thank you to you for attending today's event, and we hope to see you next year at the fifth annual Savannah Logistics Lunch. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.